Hello and welcome back to Neuroblast Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Dawson, and today we will be diving into concussions and traumatic brain injuries. Thank you so much for tuning into the last two episodes. I'm really excited about this podcast. I thank each and every one of you for your feedback and for tuning in. So with no further ado, let's go ahead and get started. This is an interesting topic. It's got a lot of confusion across the board. And, you know, this is something that is very prevalent in our society today. So we need to talk about not only brain health, neuroplasticity, but brain injuries, traumatic brain injuries, concussions. So let's just start by describing and, and recognizing what is a concussion. Well, a concussion does not depending on who you ask, does not require loss of consciousness, okay? Only merely a change in consciousness. Now, that's depending on who you ask, like I said, whether it's a, a, a diagnosis given by an insurance company or a diligent a doctor that's really diving in and trying to understand the symptomology and the signs that the body is giving regarding that person in front of them, okay? So, Merely a change in consciousness, okay? So we're looking at things like headaches, confusion, amnesia, dizziness, ringing in the ears, nausea, vomiting, slurred speech, decreased recall of words, okay? Excessive yawning and fatigue, irritability, mood swings, noise intolerance, and reduced alcohol intolerance. So these are some of the, the more known symptoms that are associated with concussions and and help us identify whether or not somebody has even had a concussion because we can't see it. We cannot see a mild traumatic brain injury on a CT or MRI. Now, the reason that people take those after a traumatic injury is to recognize if there is any bleeding or hemorrhaging inside the brain because at that point, it becomes a more serious condition and can lead to things like uh, falling into a coma. Okay, so that's why they say don't fall asleep right after you have a head injury because we don't want to slip into that. But there has been no evidence to support the fact that uh, mild traumatic brain injuries and concussions inhibit you from taking a nap right after. Okay, so once we've cleared that, once we've made sure it's totally fine, and in fact, it's promoted to go and rest your body and rest your brain after a traumatic injury like that. We know that in the United States, there are anywhere from 1.6 to 3.8 million concussions per year, 6 to 9% of which are collegiate high school athletes. Now, we have to remember that 80% of concussions never get diagnosed, and the chance after you've had a concussion for you to experience another concussion is increased exponentially because you've lowered the threshold on which the brain can repair itself. So it's more susceptible to injury. It's actually three times more likely that you're going to have a second concussion within six months to a year if you've already had one concussion because that brain is primed. You're actually in a prime state to injure it again. It doesn't take as much. And then we talk about, well, how long do these concussions last? You know, after the initial injury, how long can they last? Well, you know, that's dependent. That's very, that's arguable. That's something that we're trying to dis, uh, discuss because acute versus chronic uh, brain injury is something that goes way further deeper than the initial injury, right? That's talking more about lifestyle. What are we doing? What's our environment? What are we, how are we using our body? How are we flushing out some of these toxins I'm going to talk about later that are inhibiting our brain from healing? So how long does it last? Well, uh, symptoms can present almost immediately afterwards. And then within two to four weeks with rest, you can have about 90% of your symptoms resolved. Now, we have to remember that loss of symptoms does not equal optimization. Just because we do not have symptoms, whether that's depression, anxiety, or chronic pain, or whatever you want to relate it back to, does not mean that we're living our best life. Okay, so that's something very, very important that we have to remember no matter what we're doing. And going into some of the testing regarding concussions. Now we have some standardized testing, one of those being the SAC test. This is a, a standardized assessment for concussions as well as the balance error scoring system. Now there's different opinions on which tests are the best, 
There's actually a group of doctors that meet every single year that go over all the baselines and all the research within the last year on concussions. And one of the more research ones lately is the King DeVic test or the KD test, which is a visual based rapid numbering naming system that validates and allows us to measure after a, an acute concussion and helps detect those things. Some of the symptoms that we were talking about earlier, headaches, irritability, vomiting, nausea, these are all signs and symptoms of a concussion. Just like anything else in the body, it's so, so important to remember that we have predisposing conditions, whether that's our genetic or our lifestyle. What is our brain health like before the injury? What's our environment like? What's our age? I mean, are we in a state for healing? Are we in a prime state for prosperity and health? Or are we stressed out? Are we in a, in a state of health that uh, we haven't exercised in a long time? Maybe we aren't eating properly. Maybe we don't like our job. Maybe we're in a bad relationship or multiple relationships that are not healthy for us, causing spikes in our cortisol level, making us stressed, making our brain already in a state that's <laughs> predisposed to injury. And then we introduce the topic of sports. Are these kids using the equipment properly? Or is the equipment outdated? What kind of drills are they doing in practice? This raises the question of what preemptive measures are the parents, the coaching staff, and even the school district taking to make sure that these kids are in an optimal state for healing, but also to prevent these catastrophic traumatic brain injuries. We know that catching these signs and symptoms earlier the better, okay? Because this allows us to get into a reparative and rehabilitative state early in that fork in the road in that individual's life. We know that high school athletes and children are much more susceptible to these injuries because once they've had one, it's so easy to have the next one. We've decreased the threshold in which our brain can absorb impact and result in more inflammatory cascade. Now, as we look at the different areas of the brain that are most highly affected and correlated to traumatic brain injuries and concussions, we have to talk about the prefrontal cortex and an area deep in the temporal lobe known as the hippocampus. Now, the prefrontal cortex is known for our decision-making and our personality. The temporal lobe and the hippocampus especially the hippocampus, is known for its ability for forming long-term and lasting memories throughout our life. On previous episodes, we talked about how important maintaining the function of our pathways and in doing so, it correlates highly with our function of our brain. Now, these pathways are made up of what's called axon bundles, okay? Axon bundles, and whenever these axon bundles are damaged through high impact or a concussion, traumatic brain injury, they start to fray, okay? They start to fray like a rope that's been pulled too tight. And people that have had these frayings perform much worse on cognitive tests, okay? So what allows this bundle to maintain and hold together, what allows this bundle to maintain and hold together is a protein, called the tau protein. This tau protein is responsible for supporting microtubules inside your neurons and inside the cells. Now, whenever we have repeated hits and damage to these tubules, that causes the proteins to kind of dislodge, and then they start to clump together. And this drives the breakdown in the connections in between neurons inside of our brain and these clumps start to accumulate and they accumulate and over time they go undiagnosed and they build up and the breakdown of these tubules releases toxins and then the microglia these little immune cells in your brain like to go in and try and clean it up and they're releasing inflammatory cytokines and the toxins themselves can actually damage and hurt other surrounding neurons that maybe weren't hurt during the impact. And so we see that the breakdown of these connections 
leads to cognitive decline and over time can lead to post-concussive syndrome, which consists of symptoms that involve learning disturbances, mood swings, and can definitely affect your relationships and your goals. Now, these breakdowns can also, over time, once you get into the 30s and 40s, whenever they have been undiagnosed and untreated for years on top of an unhealthy lifestyle, stressful environments, whether that's mechanical or even biochemical stresses especially. And then we look at this. And over time, can lead to chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which like I said, are the changes in mood and behavior, this chronic fatigue of the brain over time, this chronic de degeneration that's been so highly correlated with our outlook and our depression. Now, taking care of our brain and optimizing our brain is the only way that we're going to optimize our life. And after we've had chronic injuries on top of poor lifestyle choices, we're literally setting ourselves behind the eight ball and trying to climb our way back. And it's really hard, so hard. And it's trippy. The brain is just trips you up like that because whenever you're in these states of repair, whenever you're in these states of inflammation, these post-concussive states, you don't realize that your fatigue is from your injury. You don't realize that your irritability is from your injury. You don't even realize sometimes that your personality has changed. Maybe the people around you have, but you don't make that connection. And sometimes that can take months for those symptoms to present. So you don't even relate it back to your initial injury. And there you are four or five months down the road and you're having mood swings. Maybe you're already stressed out because you are in a job or you're in a school or you're in a sport where you were kind of pressured into going back into that situation or scenario earlier than your body and your brain was ready to. And so now we predispose ourselves to stress while we're already in a stress state that will lead to personality changes, that will lead to conflicts in our, in our relationships and conflicts inside of ourself and reaching our own goals. And it makes the your life force, so depressed, so low, and very, very frustrating. So it's like we're hitting, getting hit from every angle, not only physically, not only psychologically, but biochemically. Our, our structure is changing and reinforcing negative pathways that no longer serve us and that are not healthy and only going to lead to cognitive and brain degeneration. And when we're talking about cognitive and brain degeneration, we have to kind of relate this back to those proteins. What are we talking about on a molecular and a physiological level? Well, there's tau proteins that hold the microtubules together. They begin to clump together, and we see that in Alzheimer's. Okay, This is why Alzheimer's is considered to be an incurable disease because it's already been spent. The, there's nothing left. <laughs> to rebuild at that point. And it's almost like you got to think of it as investing these preventative brain exercises, these things that I'm going to talk about next are are investments into your brain, into your life, into your future, almost like a 401k because once you get to the end of your life and you hit those trials and tribulations that come with aging, is your brain in an optimized state to keep going in case you do have an injury or just to deal with the, the stresses of life? Or have you been degenerating over the years and these proteins have built up to a point where there is no going back? And even though we're talking about Alzheimer's, the onset being from traumatic brain injuries and concussions and this chronic concussion over time, we have to remember that Alzheimer's is also induced by uh, insulin resistance. So our body and our brain's inability to uh, use insulin and reuptake sugar. Sugar can cause massive damage on our brain. Even though our brain loves to use glucose, it actually prefers to use ketones. And we can talk about the ketogenic diet later on. But whenever we're talking about this, we have to mention that Alzheimer's is actually called type 3 of diabetes. So there's more than one way to get there, and it all equates to the same result. So what we really have to do is start looking 
and really asking the questions. If you're a parent, talk to the coaches, talk to the school staff, and let's develop, speak up on this topic so that we can start to develop constructive conversations on recognizing and preventing these traumatic brain injuries and concussions in our young youth and high school athletes. I always tell my patients, especially the parents of you know younger patients, that it's so much easier to keep your child healthy than it is to fix a broken adult. So let's go ahead and start talking about some of the treatments now because as we go into uh, the preventative measures and the treatments, there's a lot of overlap. First and foremost, one of the best ways to prevent not only brain injuries and degeneration from concussions, but chronic injury stress over time is stop having our youth athletes specializing in a single sport year round. Okay. Whether that's baseball, soccer, football, whatever. We don't want uh, our young athletes to be a, a single dimensional or a one dimensional type of athlete. We're seeing a higher and higher prevalence of this where kids and youth athletes are playing these sports year round and we're predisposing them to chronic injuries, whether that's an ACL tear, or UCL tear, or some kind of chronic stress that not only leads to damage on their joints and their body, but also leads to burnout. And then when burnout sets in, chronic fatigue sets in, and you even you predispose that person even more so to the injury because of loss of dynamic and loss of technique. Technique is so important whenever it comes to proper mechanics, especially when it comes to sports, running, throwing, or anything that we're doing in repetition, even sitting. So proper rest, proper recovery is absolutely essential. Rest and recovery are just as and maybe even more essential than the training itself. You got to think, what if you worked all the time but never went to sleep? We have to give our body and our joints and our nervous system and our muscles the chance to repair. It's just like after a workout, whenever you go to the gym or maybe you go try a new exercise or hold a new pose in yoga, you're sore the next day. But that soreness is actually a part of the healing process and you're going to come back stronger as long as we don't overwork it and cause injury to that area and strain or sprain the muscle or ligaments. Now, when we start talking about muscles and ligaments and soft tissues, we have to refer back to the cervical spine, okay? Now, a lot of times whenever we have traumatic injury to the brain and the cranium, there is a cervical spine involvement. Now, we know that 90% of nutrition to the brain is induced by motion of the spine. Now that's allowing blood flow not only to get up into the brain but also to the intervertebral discs of the spine, allowing proper motion and dynamic to take place and proper pumping and fluid motion of the cerebral spinal fluid that is encased inside of the meninges, giving that brain the nice, juicy, and yet buoyant state environment that it needs to be in. If the CSF is stagnant or maybe it's high in pressure, that can lead to symptoms itself, such as headaches and irritability and cognitive decline. So these little things we have to look into. This is why it's so crucial to get children and infants checked from the earliest stage possible for damage and loss of motion in the neck and into the spinal cord. We know that the spine brings nutrients to the brain, and it happens through motion. So if we lose motion, if we lose dynamic at an early stage in life, we are predisposing ourselves to injuries later. Okay, so for example, maybe it's time to go to the hospital. Baby's been inside mom for nine months, and we rush to the hospital. Cortisol levels are starting to go up. Everybody's getting excited, and... Then we go into labor, and the labor takes place for, you know, sometimes four or five hours, maybe all the way up to 60, 70 hours I've seen. And so with each contraction, mom just pushing with the weight of the universe, pressing, and that baby's upside down, just pressing down, maybe onto the pelvic floor that's not quite open yet. And for hours and hours and hours, we get this compression and this force on the cervical spine and spinal cord and on the brain. And then what happens? Time to come out. 
after all of that. And sometimes we use forceps and these techniques that pull and bring a lot of tension into the cervical spine after all that compression. And we never check to make sure that the dynamic in the spine and in the cervical spine, especially upper cervical, atlas and axis, or C1 and C2, is in motion with the cranium, holding the cranium, and allowing the transmission through the brainstem down to the spinal cord to be proper and effective so that that baby is not predisposed to any injuries and has the right start that it deserves so that as we age, we're not predisposed to more injuries. Because we know kids fall. We know babies fall. We know everybody has injuries. But we want to make sure that those don't accumulate to the point that's going to predispose us to cognitive decline. And make sure that once we are into a youth sport state that our bodies are ready for it and we haven't had this hidden mechanical stress over time that has predisposed that child to an injury of the cervical spine or even the brain. So rest and proper motion and dynamics of the spine and cranium and especially the cervical spine so that we can have clear, direct conduction of our energies between the brain down and throughout the body and back up again is so, so crucial. So part of that motion, part of being able to move and rest is to remove toxins, remove these cytokines, remove these inflammatory chemicals that build up after an injury or a lesion to the brain. So we have to bring in new materials bring in a very healthy uh, oxygen and nutrient-rich blood supply to provide the brain and those cells and neurons with what they need to supply for their recovery. And in doing so, we're flushing out and we're removing these toxins that build up inside the neurons and outside the neurons that can affect the surrounding healthy neurons and actually cause them to be damaged or killed too. So we have to remove the toxins. We have to bring in an increased oxygen supply. We have to make sure that the spinal cord and the spinal dynamics are moving the way they're supposed to. And then we start moving into exercise and cognitive exercises. So as we go into the health benefits of exercise on the brain, it is truly transformative because we are removing these toxins I previously talked about and inputting fresh, nutrient-rich, oxygen-rich blood supply. We know that damaged brains lead to depression and low energy, our inability to focus or maintain our attention, and destruction and inhibition of accessing long-term memories. So exercise, bringing in new materials, getting rid of old toxins is absolutely imperative, and it has immediate effects on neurotransmitters such as increasing dopamine, increasing serotonin, increasing norepinephrine, and even getting an endorphin release sometimes that makes you feel good. You have an uplifting sensation in your mood. You have an increase in your attention for sometimes even two to three hours just after a 30-minute exercise and faster recovery time. So we know that just exercising for three to four days a week for 30 minutes, cardiovascular exercise, you know, intermittent training, and this type of motion, just getting outside and moving, cleaning, vacuuming, <laughs> cleaning your house, this type of motion actually helps produce new cells in the hippocampus itself and it increases its volume, its ability to form new memories, and it helps repair the prefrontal cortex, two of the areas that are highly associated with brain degeneration and injury after a traumatic brain injury or concussion. These benefits are lasting as well because they increase the neurotransmitters, and in doing so, we're removing the toxins, bringing in new oxygen, increasing our neurotransmitters, and this acts as a protection for the brain. This allows us to protect and actually be ready for new injuries. If they ever do happen, we can withstand that. We've increased our threshold now, and we've decreased our susceptibility to degeneration. So we have to think of it much like that 401k or the savings that we need at the end of our life, just as if 
we were preparing for our financial savings, we have to prepare for our cognitive and our neurological savings later on. Now, going into the rehabilitative portion of this segment, we have to remember that some of these stories are amazing. And we look back at, you know, uh, Ponce de Leon, the, uh, the rookie starter for the Cardinals that just made his major league debut a couple weeks ago. If you guys don't know this story, please look into it because it is amazing. This young man has been through so much. He actually got hit in the head with a line drive last year and went through all this rehab. And one of the things that he talked about was just getting his body back into a prime state so his brain can heal. So using the exercise in a proper pattern. Okay, the combination in which we uh, bring these different types of approaches in, depending on the person and their state of healing, is very, very important. Okay, so just starting off with light motion, starting off with basic movements, starting off with physical therapy exercises, going into yoga, then building up into our throwing and running and weightlifting routines. That slow progression over time led to him being able to make a full recovery and then in his major league debut came out through seven shutouts no hit innings which is absolutely amazing so if you don't know that story go check it out it's truly inspiring additionally another great treatment that we love to utilize in our office and that i've utilized in my own story is the hyperbaric oxygen therapy chambers where we actually lay inside of a tube for 30 to 45 minutes sometimes upward to an hour now what this does is increases the atmospheric pressure around your body and actually forces in oxygen into your body to start healing the tissues faster and especially has been shown to help decrease inflammation. So even though oxygen can act as a free radical inside of our body, we need to make sure that our diet is lined up with this type of therapy so that we can remove those free radicals with antioxidants such as glutathione and vitamin C and vitamin A and so forth. As previously spoke about, the diet and having highly nutritious food and a blood supply to these lesions is so crucial. So decreasing our amount of sugar, improving the amount of plant-based foods that we're eating, and then also incorporating cannabidiol because we know that we do have an endocannabinoid system. Now, if you don't know what cannabidiol is, it's a non-psychoactive cannabinoid found in cannabis that's been utilized for uh, helping with um, things such as epilepsy and seizures and just gross inflammation throughout the body. We know that a lot of our symptomology inside of our body comes from a dysregulation inside the endocannabinoid system itself. This cannabinoid acts as a modulator within our own immune system and nervous system. It's found on every single cell in our body, even some receptors on the mitochondria. So it actually goes in and helps stimulate healing and act as a modulator. If something is overworking, it's going to slow it down. If something's underworking, it's going to help pick it up. And so this cannabidiol is a great way and it's been shown to not only help with pain and some of the symptoms of concussions, but actually help the brain repair itself. And so I think that this is something that we have to look more into and utilize to our benefit. Think of it more as a food or a supplement for yourself and not a drug because, it, like I said, this is non-psychoactive. If you don't know what it is, please go check into CBD and be aware of its benefits. And lastly, another great exercise is just mindfulness. Having a morning mantra, waking up in the morning, being mindful of what we're going to do throughout our day, setting our intentions, starting off with a nice morning walk or exercise routine and going into some stretching so that we feel good and ready for our day. We feel productive before we even start our day. Having that morning mantra is absolutely crucial in our recovery, but also our commitment to ourself and being able to maintain that path of rehabilitation for its entire course. So the whole reason that I really got into neuroscience and health in general, I'd always, uh, you know, been an athlete growing up and been interested in how the body worked been interested in the mind and the psyche. And over time, I even went to uh, you know school for uh, kinesiology, and I really like to study the way the body moves. And that led me into this the overlap of you know our brain body connection because there's so much overlap. We cannot separate nervous system health from gastroimmune health, from 
our integumentary health, from our musculoskeletal health. The nervous system controls and regulates every single other system in the body. So if we do not have proper function of our brain, spinal cord, and nerves, we are not going to have proper function of all the other systems and at least maintain proper communication between those systems so that we can prevent dysfunction, loss of homeostasis, and disease. And there's so much new amazing research coming out. We're actually finding that there are cells inside of our brain known as double cortin positive cells that are actually almost like stem cells that go in and repair the brain and they're found primarily in the area of near the lesions. So there is tons of new evidence coming out to support not only the detection but the treatment and the prevention of these concussions and traumatic brain injuries. And it's amazing to see some of these results, not only on paper, but in the actual practice and in my life. The whole reason that I came to health, the whole reason that I even started on this journey in neuroscience to study the brain, to even start this podcast, began way long ago whenever I was a child and I noticed that I had a higher susceptibility to fainting, and I had a, an a acute reaction to a lot of medicines that actually made me pass out, like a reaction one time that I had to a cortisone injection in my shoulder for baseball. I actually fainted in the lobby about 20 minutes later, and I fell back, and I hit my head on the water fountain, and I woke up with a splitting headache, and people standing around me, I didn't know where I was at, I most definitely... Now that I'm older and have a chance to reflect on it, have studied this, did experience a concussion. And so as I was progressing through life after that, I experienced other traumatic brain injuries. One of them, of which was during my second year of my doctoral program, whenever I was out eating <laughs> cheeseburgers and ice cream with some friends for a birthday. And I had actually uh, had this reaction from swallowing too much ice cream at once. You guys know what I'm talking about whenever you swallow something that's too big and you kind of get that lump in your chest and it hurts going down. Well, that's what it felt like, but it was also very cold. And what happened was a uh, what's called a, a vasovagal syncope where I actually had a stress response and a spasm in the esophageal plexus around my esophagus that sent a message up to my vagus nerve all the way up into my brain telling me that I need to go horizontal. So it laid me out. I passed out right there after taking one drink of ice cream and I woke up. I woke up with people standing around me and I had severe headache and I started to notice over the next couple of days that I uh, was tired I was fatigued. I was, uh, my head was sore. It hurt like my head, the location where I hit it hurt for a couple of weeks because I, I literally like hyper extended as I went back and felt right on my head when I had this reaction to this milkshake I was drinking. So a hypersensitive neurological system is one thing, but whenever it leads to, uh, injuries and concussions, it makes it even harder for our bodies to heal, as I've been talking about. And so I was going through school, and I noticed during those six months after school, I was a mess. I was miserable. Everything was hard. I was scared. Uh, I couldn't remember very much. And I was going through a doctoral program, mind you, so I was studying a lot still, putting my brain through uh, exercises that it was not ready for, putting my body and my mind through stress that it was not ready for. And that led to me to change my personality. I became somebody that I didn't really uh, recognize anymore. I was frustrated a lot. I had mood swings. I had um, horrible manners in the fact that like I was just irritable. Irritable. Especially with the, the, the woman that I was with at the time, I still to this day think that like the reason that our relationship didn't work out was because of my personality change after the concussion that I had no idea was actually happening in that moment in time. It 
took me years later to reflect and realize that my symptoms and my behaviors and my the 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 fatigue and irritability and the weakness that I had was all a byproduct of my brain chemistry and my ability to heal. And so once I was done with school, I finished school strong, but not as well as I started it. And I got through and I started to heal myself. So once I was done with school, I really started to do more yoga and exercising. I started to be more mindful. I changed my diet because I actually had a severe reaction to a pesticide on an apple and almost died from anaphylaxis in the hospital. So it's like I've had these series of events in my life that have led me to this path to be able to tell you this story, say, we need to eat more organic food. We need to be more mindful about how we're exercising, how we're motioning. And then whenever we do have cognitive decline or we do have brain injuries, how do we go about recovering from those so that it doesn't affect our long-term relationships and goals with ourselves and the ones that we love? Because it's so crucial. It's so important to make sure that we have a support group around us, but also uh, we support and give ourselves what we need in order to heal and, and, and be patient with that because a brain injury is something that is, is very depressing and it causes uh, a lot of insecurity and you don't even realize you're doing it. So whenever we are around people or children or people that have had these brain injuries, we don't want to overanalyze every single thing that they do in their behavior because sometimes that is a byproduct just as a normal person we have a byproduct, our behaviors are byproducts of our environment and our life. We have to remember that sometimes these people going through uh, their rehabilitation do not realize what state of health they're even in. And that's the trippiest part about brain health and brain degeneration is you don't know. You don't know when you're in that state. And so it's, uh, it's sad to see, and, but it's also a story of redemption because our brains are so resilient. I'm firsthand living proof that we can not only overcome uh, other things that I will talk about in future episodes, other stories going back into the diet and you know my anaphylaxis story, I will touch on in a different episode, but these things add up. These things add up and brought me to where I need to be in my life, to where I could heal my brain, to the point where I was actually happy again. And then I started to become motivated and I started to love myself more and I started to help people. And then that just became exponential, right? And so what we have to do is heal ourselves. We have to give ourselves the time to heal, put ourselves in the environments to heal, so that we can invest in our own future and then start rebuilding this world into a more sustainable, healthy place because we all have traumas, we all have events, and I think that we really need to treat our brains as if we have had some kind of traumatic brain injury because, like I said, we have to invest in our future. We have to invest in our brain health. So thank you so much for listening to my story listening to my recovery. I think that using exercise, yoga, uh, well-rounded plant-based, vegan, organic diet is absolutely crucial to brain health. Uh, You know, if you're not vegan, try to get as many plant-based foods as you can, okay? We can go into the more specifics on different types of nutrition and also the blood chemistry. I do utilize a lot of functional medicine in my office. So looking at the blood chemistry and maintaining functional lab ranges is so crucial to maintaining that healthy blood supply to the brain. And so looking back at some of these things, it's it, it changed my life. Using CBD, getting uh, checked and making sure that my spine is moving correctly through chiropractic, making sure that my diet is correct making sure that my morning mantra and I am am well-rounded in how I feel and prepare for my day. So this concludes the episode on concussions and traumatic brain injuries. We got to cover some of the different topics regarding what is a concussion, can we see it, who does it affect, how long do they last, how do we even test for it, what are some of the predisposing conditions, 
what are areas of the brain that are affected? What are some of the treatments? We went into uh, my story. And so I want you guys to leave some comments or just let me know if there's anything else that I did not cover regarding concussions, regarding brain injuries that we can go in deeper to on another episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Like I said, I'm Dr. Ryan Dawson. From the bottom of my heart, I really appreciate you all listening to my story and to this podcast on how we can recover not only from brain injuries and things that have happened in our past, both physically and biochemically, but also how we can turn that around and redeem ourselves and build a life of neuroplasticity, trying new things. Whenever I was healing, I was wanting to do everything that I could that, you know, whether it went from making music to learning a new language to trying new sports, I was doing everything I could because I was afraid of slipping back into that weak state. And that actually promoted more healing in my brain too. So the topic of neuroplasticity is the future. This is how we're going to change our lives. This is how we're going to change our, our world and become this global planetary species that creates a sustainable living approach for all. Thank you so much. I'm Dr. Ryan Dawson signing off. I appreciate each and every one of you, and I look forward to speaking with you again very soon. Have an absolutely amazing day.